One of the things I love to do in LA is I love playing basketball. I, I, I've loved playing basketball most of my life, and I began playing on the streets when I was younger. And, and my wife, Kim, she's always trying to get me to stop playing because, as she would put it, I'm old. And uh, I break more easily now, and I don't recover as fast. And she's like, are you ever going to outgrow this? And I said, no, I don't think so. I, I, think, I think I'm going to do this till I die. It doesn't really matter. And, and so every week, I run a gym and at a Jewish community center, and, I, and my guys come over, we play basketball, and you know, sometimes we'll invite some new people to play with us, and we'll play for about two hours. And now lately we've been playing a lot of full court. We just play two hours of full court, whether it's 100 degrees, there's no air in there, it's sweltering. And the last time we played, one of our guys invited some new, some new players. It always like changes the atmosphere when there's some new players. You know, and one of them was a former Olympic athlete. He was a sprinter. Another guy was like a former college baseball player. So there was a lot of ego in the room. But they were older. You know, they were like older than 30. Because most of the guys I play with are like 22, 25, 27. And then there's me, about 60. And we're having this amazing time playing. But no one wants to act like they're tired. And we're, we're running full court up and down the court. And we're, we're shooting terribly because we're so tired. We're so exhausted by the time we get to the end, we can't even aim. But we don't act like it. We're just playing hard, knocking each other down, having this amazing time. And we had about 15 minutes left on the clock. And everybody was sitting down, just gasping for air. It was just so hot. And I looked at everybody. They were so tired. And I said, come on, one more game. I didn't want to play one more game, but I thought I'm going to do this, you know. One more game. And I could see they were so exhausted they were not going to say yes. So I could be the guy going, yeah, you guys quit. You quit on me. I wanted to play one more, but you guys are just, you just can't take this. And, and they didn't get back up. And I got back in my car. My son Aaron looked at me. He goes, hey, Dad, you okay? I said, yeah, I'm fine. I'm good. I started driving home. And as I was driving home, I, I, I felt something happening to my body. I, I think it was death. <laughs> and, and, and then before I knew it, I had to open the door in Beverly Hills, and I just started puking on the street. It was really elegant. And, and I drove just a little bit longer, and I just had to open the door and start puking some more. And then I'm not going to make it home. And I was just shaking, and I, I was, I'm sure I was dehydrated. And, and as I was saying, I, I was dying, and, and, and I, was, I thought, I'm not going to make it. I was going to pull over just to stop and be sick stationary by that. If I stop, I'll never make it home. So I just kept going and driving and driving down Wilshire Boulevard. And I got closer to the house and man, I just started puking again. It just, it was terrible. And I pulled up to the front of the house and I, I, I saw a, a human like body through the window and I knew it was my wife, Kim. I hoped it was my wife, Kim. And, and I got out of the car and I literally started like yelling, but I had no energy. I was like, Kim, Kim. And she couldn't hear me, so I was crawling my way up the, the stairs to, to where we live, and I, I'm just staggering into the door, and there's a door open, so I just throw myself through and, and throw myself on the ground. I'm like, Kim, help me. And she's running over, what's, what's going on? I said, I'm sick. And, and it was just so bad, I just, kept, I just kept losing it for the next three hours. And I started wondering why it didn't bother me when we were playing. I started looking back on so many times in my life. You ever have those moments where you didn't know how much something costs you till later? Yeah. And I, I used to be a sprinter, and, and I, used, I used to be an athlete, and I, and I remember when you hit that point of, of just absolute exhaustion, when, when you thought you couldn't go any further, when you hit that wall, but, the, but there was something that was more important to you than the pain. Because maybe there was, a, there was an outcome, a victory, a finish line, that mattered more to you than this pain. So I took a moment and I just started looking up the, the whole phenomenon of, of a second wind. Because I was wondering, is it just a psychological phenomenon or is it like a, a physiological phenomenon? So here's what I found. Second wind. A second wind is a phenomenon in distance running, such as marathons or road running, as well as other sports, whereby an athlete who is out of breath and too tired to continue suddenly finds the strength to press on at top performance with less exertion. And I think that phrase is really interesting. Top performance with less exertion. They're saying the phenomenon of a second wind is when you hit this wall and you cannot go any further when you're out of breath and you're too tired to continue, that if you actually press to this wall, you'll actually move to a higher level of performance at less exertion. 
says that the feeling may be similar to that of a runner's high. The most obvious difference being that the runner's high occurs after the race is over. See, there are some of us here who understand what it is to have a runner's high. You finish the race, you won, you have adrenaline rushing. But I think most of the time, that's the only experience we actually aspire toward. The only experience we think we want. We don't even know this concept of a second wind. It goes on to tell us some scientists believe the second wind to be the result of the body finding the proper balance of oxygen to counteract the buildup of lactic acid in the muscles. Others claim second winds are due to the endorphins being produced. And I started wondering if there's this actual physiological experience of having a second wind, of hitting a wall where you think you cannot go any further, but actually on the other side of that wall is a more extraordinary version of yourself. And I started wondering if that's true physiologically, is that even more so in our own spiritual journey? Is it possible that God wants us to, to run this race called life with such intensity and courage and determination that we all hit the second wall? We all hit this wall. Have you ever come to the end of your soul? I can't go any further. Maybe that's the way you feel right now at the end of the conference. You're exhausted. You've given everything you have, but you've just volunteered to pull off this extraordinary event. And tomorrow, you're going back to work. And, and let me tell you, you may not be aware of this, but sometimes when you are physically exhausted, that's when you're most spiritually vulnerable. And you don't even make the connection that you've just become really vulnerable to other things, emotional devastation, relationships messing up, choices that will just absolutely ruin your future. All of that can actually happen when you're emotionally exhausted because you hit this wall. But God doesn't want that wall to be the end of your story. It is not the end of your race. God wants to take you through that wall. Because there's an extraordinary you waiting on the other side. So I started wondering, is there anyone in the scriptures that, that kind of hit the wall and then found their second wind? And of course, the answer in my mind came right away. It's Peter. Because no one messes up more than Peter. <laughs> you ever notice how whenever we want to feel good about ourselves, we just go to Peter? <laughs> so I want you to look at a moment in the life of Peter, and it makes me a little bit nervous because whenever you go to a passage that everybody knows, your brain immediately tells you you know everything you need to know. But I, I want you just for a moment to hear a passage you know and maybe hear it in a way that you've never known it before. Matthew 14, beginning of verse 25. It says, shortly before dawn, that's early in the morning, <laughs> just in case, you know when you're finally going to bed. <laughs> shortly before dawn, Jesus went out to them walking on the lake. When the disciples saw him walking on the lake, they were terrified. It's a ghost, they said, and they cried out in fear. But Jesus immediately said to them, take courage, it is I. Don't be afraid. Lord, if it's you, Peter replied, tell me to come to you on the water. Come, he said. Then Peter got down out of the boat, walked on the water, and came toward Jesus. When he saw the wind, he was afraid and began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. Immediately, Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. You a little faith, he said. Why did you doubt? And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. Then those who were in the boat worshipped him, saying, Truly, you are the Son of God. Now, I'm pretty certain everyone here has at some time had a conversation or heard a talk about Peter getting out of the boat and walking in the water. So I don't want to spend my time talking about that. I mean, we have to talk a little bit about it just to get to the part I want to talk about. Because, you see, the only part I really care about is the walk back. See, no one, everyone, no one ever talks about the walk back. Everyone talks about Peter getting out of the boat and walking to Jesus and then sinking. And somehow we just forget the rest of the story. So yes, Peter hit his wall. Peter began to sink. Peter lost his focus. He lost his faith. He began to drown. But no one ever seems to talk about the fact 
that something happened after that. So, so let's get there. Shortly before the dawn, Jesus went out to them. I, I love how, how Matthew writes this like it's so expected. Jesus comes out in the morning walking on the water. It's like, of course, that's what everybody does if their name is Jesus and he happens to be the son of God. And then when the disciples saw him walking on the lake, which is what, of course, Jesus does, they were terrified. Now, this to me is really funny because these are like men's men. These are burly men. These are fishermen. They faced a lot of storms. They, they've had a lot of life-threatening moments in their life. They're not going to show fear easily. And they see Jesus walking in the water and says, and they were terrified. And one of them yells, it's a ghost! I mean, two of them are called John and James. They're brothers. They're called the sons of thunder. It's a ghost! They said, and they cried out in fear. Ah! Something like that. A very manly cry. The kind of cries that men only let out when there's only men. Because <laughs> if there's one woman there, they'd be going, hmm. Something on that water over there. <laughs> because if there's one woman, the men will hope she'll scream on their behalf. <laughs> they're there by themselves, so they start screaming. And Jesus says to them immediately, take courage. It is I. Don't be afraid. So here it begins. Then Peter says, Lord, if it's you, Prove yourself. Do, do, do a miracle. Of course, he's already walking on water. That, that, that's a high-level miracle. That's sort of like a Michelin star miracle. That's a five-star miracle. I mean, he's walking on water. Lord, if it's you, how many other people could it be? It's not Bartholomew. That guy never does anything in the Bible. Lord, if it's you, tell me to come to you on the water. I love Peter's mindset. Not, Lord, if it's you, stop the wind and the waves. Lord, if it's you, take away the clouds and give us some sunshine. Lord, if it's you, walk. Oh, well, you're already walking on water. Let me think of another miracle that would be just as amazing. No, he says, Lord, if it's you, I don't want you to prove who you are to me. I want you to prove who I am with you. <laughs> See, there's only one way Peter could know it's Jesus, is that Jesus would change the actual quality of Peter's existence. Lord, if it's you, call me out to the water. I mean, how many times have you ever asked God for a miracle, but you don't want God to involve you in the miracle? And I love how complicated Jesus makes it. Come. Good idea. I like that. It's like that. That'll prove it. If, if me walking on water to you doesn't prove it, you walk in the water to me, that'll nail it down. He says, some of you, you'll keep doubting who God is because you keep wanting God to act outside of you. But you'll only know who God is when you ask God to change your experience, your life, your journey. This is so good. He's basically saying, there's a lot of places I could go, Jesus, if you're not around. Come on, let's be really honest. We, we all act like everything in our life, God did it. Right? You ever you heard that? Oh, yeah, no, I didn't, I didn't write that song. God wrote it. It's not that good. Okay? It's like, you know? It's like, oh, no. Like, people say to me, I know you didn't write your books. I said, no, I, I actually did. See, God wrote a book, but it's not this one. Okay? God's book is just called the Bible, like, basically paper. And uh, my book's called The Last Arrow. It's not as good. If you go your whole life without reading my book, you'll be okay. But if you go your life without reading God's book, you're not going to be okay. And so, 
So let's not pretend everything is God that we do. There's some things you do. See, there are places you could go without God. There are people right now who are very successful and they don't believe in God. They, they have great wealth without God. There are people who have accomplished incredible things without God. Now, they were created by God and they don't realize that all their gifts and talents and intelligence is a gift from God to them. But still, there are places you can go without God saying, come. My question is, where are you right now? Are you in the place where you could only be because Jesus has said, come? See, because if you're going to catch your second wind, you've got to look how far you've come. See, when Jesus said to Peter, come, we know how the story goes out, but he says, come. And then Peter got down out of the boat and he walked on the water and he came toward Jesus. And I don't want us to just skip over that as if that's not extraordinary. Only two people on record have ever walked on water. Jesus and Peter. That's like, who's better, LeBron or MJ? <laughs> You can talk about that forever, but there's only been two men who've ever walked on water, and one's name was Jesus, and the other one's name was Peter, but Jesus could walk on the water without Peter, but Peter could not walk on the water without Jesus. <laughs> so when you get exhausted, when you feel like you're at the end of yourself, when you feel like you can't take one more step, when you feel like you're done, you need to look and see how far you've come. The moment you've heard Jesus speak to you, the moment you respond to him, the moment you say, yes, Jesus, I'm crossing this line of faith and I'm all yours, you've heard him call you, come. And you have stepped into a territory you could have never walked without him. And that's the proof of God in your life. So Peter's walking toward Jesus, and I don't see anyone else jumping in. I don't see any other disciple going, wow, it works. I mean, how much proof do you need? Two, Jesus and Peter. And if you're the other disciples, you're like, Peter never gets this right. He's going to go straight down, but he doesn't. I mean, I'm thinking, if I'm the other guy, and I see him walking in the water going, no, I'm next. I want to meet two. Nobody does. So even with Peter walking in the water, there was still so much fear in the boat that left them paralyzed. They were watching God do something extraordinary, but didn't have the faith to step into it. Wouldn't it have been a better story? And they all said, we're coming! It would have been good. And then Peter walked on the water and came toward Jesus. And then it says, oh, this is the part we all remember. But when he saw the wind, he was afraid. And he began to sink. Now, when I first read this, you see, I, I didn't grow up in church. I didn't grow up reading the Bible. It was all new to me. When I started reading the scriptures, I was always amazed how many times people would say what the Bible says, but it doesn't, they wouldn't actually be saying what the Bible says. See, because every time I would hear the story, I would hear that, and then, then Peter saw the waves, and then he began to sink. And, and I kept looking, and it says, no, it says actually when Peter saw the wind. And, and so I thought, maybe it's a translation problem. So I went back to the Greek. So I thought, what, what does the Greek actually say? And here's what the Greek said, so hard to understand. It says Wind. It's, it's, it's really simple. Just when Peter saw the wind. So I, I was at this theological seminary with all these scholars and theologians, and I thought, I'm going to try this out. I'm going to do a little experiment. So I said, when Peter was walking in the water, what did he see that caused him to begin to sink? And this Greek professor right in the middle of the room starts quoting the passage from memory. I'm going, who does that? In the Greek he starts saying the Greek word, then the translation. The Greek word, then the translation. I'm going, not going to work. Darn it, I would have the one Greek scholar who has this one passage memorized. What are the chances? And then he, he says the Greek word, and then he says, and when he saw the wind and the waves, 
He added, and the waves. I said, now, can you show me the Greek word that translates, and the waves? He goes, well, it's not there. It's, it's in, inferred. It's implied. And, and a funny thing, my wife and I were, were, were speaking in two different places on the same day, and we somehow chose the same passage, this one, and in her place, she said, Peter saw the waves. And then she came over and joined me, and I said, no, Peter saw the wind. And she goes, how did I miss that? I said, because you are seeing what you're told to see. Because here's the thing. You can't see the wind, right? You can't walk on water. Now, isn't it odd? We go, well, okay, he's walking on water, but he can't see the wind. You see, if you're going to break through and get your second wind, you need to prepare for the impossible. Why in the world couldn't someone doing the impossible see the invisible? See, if I had another title for this talk besides second wind, I would call it living on the other side of reality. Because... See, Peter was walking on water. We don't know that reality. We don't know that reality. Let's just be straight up. And, and, and then while he's walking on that water, we can't explain that he can see the wind. But maybe it, 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 what happens is the moment you begin to walk on the journey that only Jesus can take you on, you begin to see things that you never even knew were real. And, Isn't that the wonder of faith? It says, by faith, it says, we, we, we have assurance of things hoped for and confidence in things not seen. What does God want to show you? What is he waiting for you to see? But you won't see it until you step out of your own boat and start walking on your own water. And so he sees the wind. And a lot of times I hear people say, well, the reason I lost my, my sight of God, the reason I took my eyes off of Jesus is that you can't see Jesus. But you, I could see the girl. It'll take you a minute. Right? Couldn't see Jesus, but I could see the guy. I, 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 I can't see Jesus, but I could see the money. I can't see Jesus, but I can see the fame. I can't see Jesus, but I can see the power. And... And so here's the crazy thing. Here's a moment where he could see Jesus, and he still took his eyes off him and saw the invisible wind. And so maybe a part of what Jesus wanted him to do was not only just be comfortable walking on water, but also comfortable in seeing the wind. Because he wants to move you to a level of experience. Remember what it said about second wind? It, it says... They find it when they're out of breath and too tired to continue. Suddenly find the strength to press at top performance with less exertion. Maybe once you start walking on the water, you begin to see the wind because God wants you to live in the impossible, invisible, because there is more in you than you ever thought. There's a level of experience, a level of living, a level that your life is intended to be experienced and lived that you can't even imagine Do you break the wall. <laughs> and it says, and immediately, oh, and then he began to sink and he cried out, Lord, save me. And immediately Jesus reached out his hand and caught him. Now, why doesn't anyone give Peter credit for that? See, if you're going to break through the wall and get your second wind, you need to remember how far you've come. Don't let anyone hold you to your past. Don't let anyone tell you that you are who you were. You are not who you were. So when people start trying to define you by the worst decisions in your past, you tell them, you don't know how far I've come. I stepped out of that boat. I've been walking on the water. You don't know where I'm going. Amen. And then you'll be prepared for the impossible. Some of you are like, I don't have enough talent. I don't have, I don't have enough intelligence. I don't have the right gifting. That's all right, because see, the material that God wants to use is the invisible material that only exists in the impossible. It's just waiting for you. 
And, and then Jesus grabs him, you see, because Peter says, Lord, save me. You want to break through the wall and catch your second wind? Remember, you did not get there alone. You didn't get there by yourself. See, Peter never forgot that he was walking on the water because Jesus had come. And so when he began to sink, he had an instantaneous reaction. Lord, save me. When I was a little kid living in El Salvador, we didn't get to go outside a whole lot. It was really violent and dangerous. But one time, my brother and I, we were probably four or five years old. We were walking with my uncle and my aunt. And my uncle was right behind me. My aunt was right behind my brother Alex. And, and from a distance, we saw the most terrifying creature we'd ever seen in our lives. And it was running right at us. And it was making the most horrific sound I'd ever heard. And I was paralyzed. I don't know if you've ever been paralyzed with fear. I couldn't move. And, and as it came at us, I, I only had like one reaction. I was standing right next to my uncle Richard. I just, I just turned around and just reached up. And he bent down and picked me up. Now, we probably were not safe, but I felt safe. Because he held me in his arms. See, in that middle of crisis, in the middle of that crisis, I didn't go, what's my best strategy? Who should I turn to? The only reason I was in my uncle's arms is because I was walking right there with him. Now, my brother Alex, he's older than me, about two years. He was always faster. He was always better. He was always quicker, but not this time. <laughs> the moment I was in my uncle's arms, he turned around and said, grab me. And he said, Alex, I can't. I, I have everyone. <laughs> and he looked at my Aunt Linda, and she was sweet, but she was skinny. <laughs> he said, dear, are you the man? And she said, I can't pick you up. You're too, you're too heavy. So my brother took off running. He panicked. And because he panicked, it took the attention off of us, and that beast went after him. <laughs> when it came to the States, I started researching and realized it's called a basset hound. <sighs> With those floppy ears and those short legs, it was one of the most terrifying things I'd ever seen in my life. <laughs> Caught my brother, bit him in the butt. <laughs> and, you know... He had the benefit of not having to see that, but experience it. But I was traumatized because I had to watch it happen. And uh, you see, I, I think a lot of times in life, when the crisis comes, we cry out to God, but we don't know where he is because we haven't been walking with God. And, And then we think it's that God doesn't care about us, that he doesn't love us, that he's not there for us, that he wants to punish us. But the reality is that we were never actually reaching out for God because whatever you're trusting in when your life is going well, that's what you're going to trust in when your life is falling apart. And, and so Peter was walking on the water and he didn't call, cry out to Jesus, but the moment he began to sink, he immediately knew what to do. Lord, save me. Because only one person could actually get him out of the boat to walk in the water. So only one person could save him the moment he's going to drown. And remember, the waves were tumultuous. There was a storm. There was force and rage, and he was going to drown. And then Jesus immediately reached out his hand and caught him. I love this about Jesus. See, I think a lot of us would go, yeah, I knew that. I knew that was going to happen. I knew you'd take a few steps, and then you get your eyes off of me, and you start looking at the wind, and there you are, uh, drowning. Uh, you know, and it's because a lot of us think when a person is drowning, that's the perfect time to teach them. Wow. We think, this is, the, this is finally your teachable moment. And the people are drowning, we're going, I told you. I told you if you made that choice. I told you if you did that. I told you if you dated him. I told you that was going to happen to you. See, what I, what I love about Jesus is he doesn't have any teaching moment with Peter at all. He just grabs him and immediately pulls him up. Because he, Peter never forgot that he didn't get there alone. But he was there because Jesus was there. And then Jesus has the teaching moment. You a little faith. Why did you doubt? And then it says, and when, that's an important word. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. I'm finally to the part of the talk I wanted to get to. <laughs> All that was just leading up to the most important part. Because see, this, this is the moment Peter hit the wall. 
He starts to sink. He loses his faith. He's filled with fear and doubt. He's drowning. He cries out to God. He can't do this alone. So Jesus picks him up. And after he picks him up, he begins to have a little conversation with Peter. Why did you doubt? Now, I want you to notice something. They're having this conversation while Peter's standing on the water. Not while he's drowning. Not while he's hoping that God will care, that God will intervene, that God will reach out for him. But after Jesus has pulled him up. So if you want to get a second wind, if you want to break through the wall, get back up. Because that's where you can have a conversation. Why did you doubt? I can see Peter standing on the water. Boat's way over there. Boats don't stay still. And Peter's going, okay, God, let's, let's get back in the boat. Peter's, Jesus is like, we're not in a hurry, Peter. You are standing where no one else has ever stood. So we're going to have a little face-to-face -face time. God to man time, Jesus to Peter time, eye to eye time. It's going to be, it's you and me time. And the conversation we're going to have, they're only going to hear about it if you tell them because no one gets this conversation if they don't step out of the boat and walk on the water. <laughs> and then, you know how the story goes on, right? Then Jesus picks up Peter and carries him like a girl, <laughs> back to the boat. And Peter's like, oh, Jesus, you're my hero. And then Jesus lifts Peter on the boat. Doesn't go like that. You know how else he doesn't go? Then Jesus walks back to the boat, walking in the water while Peter's swimming at his side. <laughs> going, you could have walked, but you didn't have enough faith, you doubter. Swim, stroke, stroke, breathe, watch that wave, come on, move it, boy. That, that's the way a lot of us live our lives with God. See, there's just a really important little phrase here, and when. They climbed to the boat. So Jesus wasn't in a hurry. And I get a sense Peter wasn't in a hurry either. I'm standing on the water, talking to the creator of the universe. And by the way, the wind was raging. The waves were beating, pounding against that boat. I could hear all these disciples. What are they talking about? They're coming back. They're going the other way. What's going on? You ever been in a storm? You can barely see them like shadows. And then they see them moving toward them. And if they were terrified when there was one man walking toward them, how terrified are they when they see two men walking back toward them? What in the world was going on when they saw Peter go under? Ah! Lord, save me! Come back. I think Peter had a little swag when he was walking back. <laughs> you know where I've been? <laughs> where you haven't been. See, so you want to break the wall and get your second wind and live a life that goes beyond your expected potential with less exertion. Don't be afraid of drowning when you live by faith. Because when you fail, and when you fall, and you will, Jesus is going to pull you right back up, and you're going to walk back, not in shame, not in failure. You're not going to walk back the same that you walked to him. You're going to be different. You're going to be changed. <laughs> then I want you to notice something. And when they climbed into the boat, the wind died down. I love God's timing. Don't you think Jesus could have performed that miracle a little earlier? 
When the moment Peter got out of the water, Jesus could have made the wind die down, but he didn't. He let the wind blow. He let the wind rage. With every step that Peter took, Jesus made a decision. I'm going to let the wind have all of its force so that you can know that there's a second wind inside of you more powerful than the wind that's raging around you. It's only when Peter got in the boat that the wind died down. And I'm just so convinced that the winds that raged around them now blew within him. And that second wind was inside of Peter. And then it says, and then those who were in the boat worshiped him. Not Peter. Jesus saying, truly, you are the son of God. See, what Peter became was he became proof of God. You want to break the the wall and get your second wind? Keep proving them wrong. Keep doing what no one else thought you could do. Keep doing what no one else thought you could do. Keep becoming the person no one thought you could become. Live the life no one imagined you could ever live. Step into the calling no one thought you had. Walk on that water. But don't be afraid of the moment you drown, the moment you sink, the moment you go under. That's just the wall. That's not the end of the story. That's the beginning of glory. I want to live. I want to live on the walk back. I want to live on the walk back. I don't want to live the story from inside the boat talking about how someone got out of the boat and lived a life that was impossible. I don't want to tell the story that someone saw the invisible. I don't want to tell the story that someone tried to do what Jesus said and began to sink. I want to live the story. I started to sink. I cried out to Jesus. He pulled me up and I walked on water. And my life will never be the same again. I don't know what you've been through, what your story is, but I know this. Some of you thought sinking was the end of your story. Some of you are suffocating because the waves and the winds are overwhelming you. Some of you, you don't think that when you cry out to Jesus, he's going to hear you because you think you've messed up. But I want you to know, he's standing there waiting for you. And the moment you cry out to him, he's just going to immediately reach down and pull you up. And he's not going to make you what you were before. He's going to make you what you've never been.